I see counseling as me giving information. It keeps me in control of the whole interaction, and it's a it's a、um, feature of being insecure.、Um, that iceberg that's underneath there, I don't know what's going to come out, and I don't know if I'm going to be adequate to deal with it. So that's the fear. Well, well, welcome to Some Stutter Law, a podcast by the Newfoundland Labrador Stuttering Association Collaborative. Some Stutter Law is Newfoundland Labrador's first podcast about living with speech and language disorders. We speak speak directly to people living with speech and language disorders and others, such as speech language pathologists, researchers. Educators and family members. We use inclusive language and themes to help rebuild confidence and hope by dismantling myths, stigma, stereotypes, and barriers. My name is Greg O'Grady, and I'm a person who stutters and a co-host of Some Stutter Law, Newfoundland Labrador's first podcast about communication disorders, along with my co-host. And I'm Caitlin Mayo. I'm a speech language pathology student. And I'm Greg's co-host on this podcast. Some stutter law mission is dismantling and rebuilding stuttering. Let's start listening. Some stutter law mandate is, in the spirit of Newfoundland Labrador humor, robust and frank interactive discussions. Some stutter law podcast aims to rebuild confidence and hope for today's and tomorrow's persons who live with speech, language, and communication barriers. By dismantling stuttering myths, stigma, stereotypes, and barriers. The objectives of Some Stutter Law podcast are raising awareness, education, understanding, and acceptance of stuttering and communication disorders within our province by providing support, current information, research, and resources. Raising awareness that communication disorders are a quality of life issue. Throughout life, stuttering and other communication impairments can impact a person's life emotionally, educationally, physically, socially, and vocationally. Some Stutter Law podcast is a safe space where guests can be themselves without fear of being judged. Today, Some Stutter Law welcomes Dr. David Lutemann. To Dr. Lutemann is. Is a professor of of of, of Emeritus Emerson College in Boston, and former director of the Thayer Lindsay Family Center Nursery for Hearing Impaired Children. He has dedicated his career to developing a greater understanding of the psychological effects and emotions associated with communication disorders. So as to encourage professionals in the field to incorporate counseling strategies in their clinical interactions, he has successfully translated this understanding into a model of counseling, which allows for content and effect exchange, and has extended his model to include families. He has lectured extensively on counseling and communication disorders throughout the United States, Canada, and abroad. He is the author of numerous articles and is fellow of the American Speech and Hearing Association, and recipient of the Frank H. Kelfner Lifetime Clinical Career Achievement Award. He has also received the 2012 Distinguished Alumni Award for from Penn State University. He is author of Counseling Parents of Hearing Impaired Children. 1979, deafness in perspective. 1986, deafness in the family. 1987, in the shadows. 1995, when your child is deaf. 2001, the young deaf child. 1999, early childhood deafness edited with Ellen Kutzer, White. In 2001. Hearing loss in children: A family guide. 
2006, counseling persons with communication disorders and their families, the sixth edition, 2017. There are two DVDs demonstrating his clinical work produced by the Stuttering Foundation, sharpening your, your clinical skills and new dimensions in counseling parents, 2012. Well, uh, well, uh, David, Caitlin and I are, 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 are you know, are, you know, really delighted to have you on some Stutter Law podcast this morning. So. Thank you very much for joining us. Welcome. Now, so would you, you know, would you like to to share, you know, share a little bit about yourself, how you, you know, you know, how you move, you know, from you know from being a, a neophyte audiologist to you know, you know, to you know to the emotional realm of, of communication disorders. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> I graduated in uh, actually the dark ages, 1960 from Penn State. And I graduated as a um, clinical diagnostic audiologist. And, and I started working at Emerson College then and teaching audiology classes and, uh, and establishing a clinic. I soon found out, it took me a couple of years, but um, I found out that, hey, I really didn't like audiology particularly. I wasn't, uh, uh, I'm, I'm uh, rather challenged when it comes to technology and audiology got more complicated and I couldn't keep up. I also didn't like the short-term exposure uh, of audiology, the, you know, the quick diagnostic one hour uh, sort of that um, the medical model of diagnosis in which you um, get a case history you test and then you counsel and the counseling model uh, that I was taught and that is still uh, prevalent and it's part of this medical model is seeing counseling as giving information and the professional's role is to inform and advise. And that's why the, uh, the client goes to the, uh, the professional for that information and that advice. And what I found out, it took me a couple of years, because I was, I was following what I was taught in grad school, this medical model, and I developed um, speeches um, uh, you know, right after I'd done the testing, I would, I would talk to the parents or to the, uh, the client if it was an adult, and I would then explain the audiogram and uh, uh, talk about hearing aids and then talk about what they would do. But it was me talking and uh, them listening and nodding their head. And, and then I assumed they went off and you know, followed through. But what I found on retesting, uh, when they came back, I found how little they understood and comprehended what I said. Because once I said, your child is deaf, or you've got a severe hearing loss, what that sets in motion, it took me a while to really figure this out. What that sets in motion is uh, cognitively, in your brain, it's a uh, survival strategy of of uh, what psychologists call flight or fight mode. You're mobilized, you can act, uh, but you're essentially in your right brain. And um, cognitively, you're not, you're not uh, re really there very much. We've all, we've all experienced this. When we've been emotionally upset, and then you try to read a book or a newspaper, you read words, but they don't connect up in your brain. And that's that phenomenon. It's that fight or flight mode. And you're in your right brain. We don't process uh, very well information. And so the clients are hearing me and they're nodding their head and they're appropriate. 
but they're not really understanding. And there's a lot of research that supports this notion that a little that clients really absorb after a diagnostic. So I, I found that um, and realized that I needed to be doing something different. This medical model of treating clients is a poor one. And also by giving advice and information, you, you disempower your client. Client is recipient and is passive and uh, um, is at the, uh, at the uh, requiring and becomes dependent on the uh, adult, on the uh, professional to uh, make decisions. So this is not what I think you want in a counseling relationship. What happened to me at uh, 1965, I started that nursery for parents of newly diagnosed deaf kids because I was finding that they weren't getting any kind of treatment. It was really an early intervention program, but we didn't really have the words for early intervention at that point. When we were diagnosing kids at around two, two and a half. And so we set up a nursery and and we were training parents to uh, work with their kids, essentially. And we became family focused and got the attention off of the, the identified patient and put it on to the caregiver. And we found if we, uh, if we take good care of the parents, the kids start turning out quite well. And so that was one of the innovations. And the second innovation was we started a support group and we took the parents away. And I, I ran that support group. And uh, what I realized is when you have a disorder of any kind, it sets you apart. That there's an existential kind of aloneness that you experience. You're the only one on your block that's got a deaf kid or a kid with autism. I mean, I, you know, I, I, my experience was with deafness, but what, I'm, what I've learned over the years is that this is not uh, unique to deafness. It's, it's a, a function of disorder. And it sets you apart and that people conspire to make you feel better to solve your problem and that this becomes emotionally isolating. People tell you, don't worry about it. Uh, you know, they're gonna cure the deafness. They've got these implants or now hearing aids and you don't have to worry about it. And what they're saying is you have no right to feel badly about having a deaf kid. And all that does is make the parent feel guilty that they are feeling badly and they have every right to feel badly. So what happens is that they get emotionally isolated and think there's something wrong with them. And by being in a support group, what I found and what they found, it was like they found each other. And the, the first support group, I still remember it vividly and it happens every time I do a support group and I'm still doing them sometimes. It's work I just absolutely love. What I found was that when we went around the room, I just asked, why are you here? What brought you here? And of course, then they talked about the deaf kid, and how they found out he was deaf, and then had to negotiate the, the, the medical system, which was also very, the, the very, um, uh, medical model kind of thing, giving information, giving advice, but isolating. And nobody paying attention to the feeling part of this thing. So that they feel really alone, isolated, something wrong with them, guilty that they feel badly. All of these are second layer kinds of feelings that they have. When they get in a group and realize that their experience is not unique, that there's a universality to it. It's like, 
wow. And every time I do a group, you get that kind of wow feeling. I'm in a room of people who really understand what I'm going through. And again, it doesn't matter what the disorder is. I've done this with, with parents of stuttering kids. I've done this with all sorts of, I've done this with adults who have a chronically ill spouse uh, or parent. Um, doesn't matter, it's universal. What we're dealing with here is loss. We're dealing with grief. And the parents have lost the life they thought they were going to have. They lost the kid they thought they were going to have. And they need to mourn. And our work as professionals here is grief work. It's to give, give the parents permission to feel badly. Or the client permission to feel badly because they have a disorder. And the single, single important clinical skill to develop is listening. Very hard for professionals to recognize that. It feels like they're doing nothing, but it's the most important thing they can do for a client. That non-judgmental listening. Let people talk about how they feel. And then they, they uh, feel better and they're able to then absorb information and move on. So that's in a, a, a rather long nutshell, is how I got doing what I'm doing. So now what would you like to know? Um, I had a quick question uh, sure. that I thought of. So a lot of my lectures recently have been talking about communicating a diagnosis and your name actually came up in some of my lectures, which I thought was interesting when Greg reached out to you. Um, but I was just wondering kind of what tips you might give to a young new SLP or an SLP student about communicating a difficult diagnosis. Yeah, uh, well, the way I evolved my diagnostic procedure, once I realized this medical model is really a bad model, uh, it's a very poor model, was I, um, I didn't worry too much about the case history at the beginning. I would ask the parents, why are you here? Or the client. And elicit their, their story. I don't have any questions. I listen. So I, I, you know, I just open-ended question. Why are you here? What brought you here? Because clients have, you know, you know, they've been the night before. You know, when you have to go to a doctor or somebody in you know, a professional, you sit and you, and you think about what you're going to say and how you're going to say it. It never comes out the way it feels like in your head, but you work on it. So you, you need to give them a chance to tell you their story. Open-ended. So that's why you ask open-ended kinds of questions. And then what I do is I, I enlist them as co-diagnosticians. So, you know, I know something about hearing test, but I don't know this child, so I need your help. And I do this with um, adults. When I went out now, I, don't, I haven't tested anybody in a long time, but what I did used to do, if an adult wanted an appointment, I say, can you bring in a family member as well? Because the family member has hearing loss too. And so I would bring the family member and the adult together. And I would uh, enlist them, particularly with, with children, as my co-diagnostician. So we're testing the kid. Do you think he heard that, didn't hear that? Um, and ideally, I couldn't always do this, but ideally, they made the diagnosis with me. It was a joint, we arrived at it jointly. Not me as the expert here, gonna take your kid and 
tell you what's wrong with it. Because that, that sets up in motion all of that bad stuff that doesn't enable them to listen at all. They're still not able to listen. But then instead of giving those speeches that I had prepared, I say to them, what do you need to know now? And I let them guide me. I give them some information, but I know I know that they they can't deal with a lot at that point. And then I I set up another appointment or another opportunity for them, but they can't come in to call me because I know they need some space to go home and cry and grieve and then think about it. And then they come back and I start off with the same question. What do you need to know now? And then I take it from there. I may give more content. I may talk about um, you know that how hard this is for you. It's an empathetic remark. This must be really hard for you. Usually we'll tell parents that. Right now it's probably the hardest time. And then tomorrow, I'll, 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 depends on the, on the situation. I may reframe it for the parent. I may say to the parents something like, I know it's very hard for you right now, but I can assure you that I've been around a long time. This kid has guaranteed you a very interesting life. See, what I've learned over the years is that, you know, these aren't tragedies. It's very easy to see having an autistic kid or a, a kid with a, a major disorder, or you, I, I was dealing with one time with, with stroke family and to see their, their husband now reduced to not being able to communicate at all. And, and I say, you know, um, this, is, this is not a tragedy. I don't tell them that, but I, for me, it's not a tragedy because what I've seen is there's all kinds of growth that happens. That, you know, we, we give to life what life demands of us. And we have capacities that are otherwise high latent. And these disorders require in the client and in the, in the caregiver, require that they use resources, they develop resources, they become better people for this. So that's why I never, I don't take it home with me. But I know that, that if I, I hang in with them, don't try to solve their problem. Let them grow, empower them. They are going to grow. They're going to be better for it. And there's a lot of pain with it. You know, there's no way, no way we can take the pain of this. And we fail, we fail them badly. Because then we we um, invalidate their feelings. So we need to acknowledge that this is, and you're going to have an interesting life. Yeah, that's some really wonderful advice. It's not anything that we've heard yet in this program. I mean, we're very we, we just started learning about this stuff. But I, I actually meet my very first ever client this afternoon. So it's, it's a great uh, a great thing to be listening to this morning. <laughs> uh, one other question I did have um, is about your thoughts on kind of the, the amount or the degree of training that an SLP or an audiologist gets on this type of approach and about counseling and such what are your thoughts on that should there be I got, more I can I could definitely guess what you're going to say but but yeah yeah and you can see already that you haven't got much 
and it depends on your on your program but most programs for slps in particular only about one quarter of slp programs are for a counseling course audiologists have gotten better because they've gone to the uh, odd degree so there's a doctoral component and they have the expansion of the courses so that they're offering now counseling courses where there's an odd program there's usually a counseling course now this didn't used to be the case but but now with the with the, um, the doctorate uh, they are most L slp programs they they have to um make some sacrifices uh, around and so one of the first courses that go for two reasons one is that um, we're into a self-perpetuating kind of model because slps don't get it in their training program they can't teach it so you get a um, you get this self-perpetuating model i got a grant in 2000 when i retired from full-time teaching use that money to train SLP teachers to teach counseling. Did it for, for three years, trained 45 teachers. But in, uh, they've written me some of them and then said, you know, I came back and I was teaching counseling, but now they've taken it away because they've been putting in disorder courses like swallowing, which wasn't there you know, it's a relatively new course. And there's all kinds of, uh, of other uh, material that they feel is, is uh, very important to get to. And so the hope is in a lot of programs is to incorporate counseling within a disorder course. But then I'm, I, my, my notion is once you do that, People see counseling as information. You go back into the into the into the uh, medical model. It's you know it's, it has a pseudo efficiency the medical model. You can, you can um, all, uh, allocate time: fifteen minutes for case history, 20, 30 minutes for testing, ten minutes for counseling, and you got another ten minutes you can write your report and see the next client so it's what i call institution centered it's it maybe it's good for the institution but it's not good for the client it's not client-centered practice client-centered practice but it needs to be taught and the problem is that you haven't got props to do it and you don't have I mean, you know most people will, will tell you that it's really important. Nobody's going to tell you counseling isn't important in the training program. But then they don't allocate space for it either. So, yeah, it's what I have devoted my life to doing. I try to get um, this listening, valuing model going as opposed to the, uh, the content based counseling. Yeah, I feel like we're almost on a similar wavelength because it's it's something that I want to do is to further my education in counseling to do another degree and be able to teach counseling to SLPs is something that I hope to do um, because we do have a counseling course in my program, but ah. that's it. <laughs> and even that is more than a lot of people get and it's still not enough. Yeah. So... <laughs> required and is it three credits yes yes both there? us and the audiology students take the counseling courses okay so you've got an odd program mm -hmm. yeah. yeah then there is a counseling class and then again the content the question is how well that's taught yeah it's it's not i take it next year um and so i'm not totally sure but i'm glad that we at least have course because that's more than other programs it's one of the reasons i was drawn to this program um but even even one course is not enough and 
So that's something that I hope to work on in the future for sure. Yeah. I've still been teaching my counseling class at Emerson, but once COVID came in, I, I, I have not been able to figure out how to do it virtually in a way that, that pleases me. So somebody else is teaching it virtually and you can teach it as a, as a content-based course. But I teach it as a personal growth um, experience, uh, experiential. So good luck. I'm glad you got at least a course. Uh, David, I, 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 you know, I read, you know, read your, or, or what do you call, called, uh, I'm just called, uh, uh, you know, the, you know, the, you know, the counseling relationship, and mm -hmm. in, in, in that, you know, you, you know, you, you know, you quoted the counseling aspect, which provides emotional support, is not prevalent in most training programs, and therefore it seems out of the scope of practice to many professionals in our discipline. Uh, Crandall, uh, uh, 1997. And then you, you also go on to say that entering the real realm of feelings usually takes fear in the hearts. Uh, I'm sorry, entering the realm of feelings usually strikes fear in the hearts of most speech and hearing professionals because it seems so out of the scope of practice. So, you know, you know, as, yeah. as, as, as a person who, who, you know, stutters, you know, like I really find it, you know, frustrating to, to, you know, to, to, you know, to, you know, to realize more and more how, you know, how, how, you know, how, how, you know, how little attention is paid paid to the emotional component of stuttering because when you know when you know when you know when you know when we talk about stuttering especially when, it, when we talk about the analogy of the iceberg you know the you know the 10 percent is the actual physical component of stuttering the the you know you know 90 or 90 percent is below the you know below the surface of the iceberg the emotional component and you know i always say that you know you know, based on my, you know, live, you know, based on my lived experience as a person who stutters, that the tip of the iceberg is not uh, uh, ten percent; it's one percent. Ninety-nine percent is below the, the surface. So, so, so knowing that there's very little attention paid to it, frust you know, frustrates me. And uh, you know, as 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 Caitlin and I are trying to do on some stutter sort of law. We're trying to bring the emotional component to the forefront, and 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 it isn't just stuttering either. It, it's it, it, it's also you know a, a, a other areas of 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 communication challenges. Now, would you know? Would you like to share your thoughts on this, David? David? Yeah, and I, uh, you know, it's what the why it strikes fear in the hearts of the of the professional is they have to give up control. See if I if I'm if I see counseling as me giving information, it keeps me in control of the whole interaction. And it's a it's a um, feature of being insecure. Um, that iceberg that's underneath there I don't know what's going to come out and I don't know if I'm going to be adequate to deal with it so that's the fear and the, the fear that professionals have in our field I'm talking about communication disorders professionals having little training there and seeing that the emotional uh aspect of the disorder leaves a person very vulnerable and so there's a fear that you're going to cause more harm than good so if i can stay with the, the narrow 
where I'm comfortable. And it looks like on the surface, and this is what clients come to, you know, you come to a doctor, you want advice, you want information. It meets and, and conforms with the expectations of the client uh, as well. So to stay there, uh, it's safe. So it goes back to, to what uh, Caitlin was talking about, having the training having the confidence to go ahead and explore with the client their feeling state. I remember, now so vividly, I'm, I'm facilitating a, a parent group. And I can still see it to, to this day. I mean, the parents, uh, I got a group of mothers of deaf kids. And I got professionals in the background seeing what I do. And one mother is, as she's sitting down, she looks me in the face and she says to me, oh, you're going to make me cry. And, and I said to her, no, I'm just going to give you permission to cry. And she started to cry. So I think professionals intuitively and they operate like like family members know that there's a lot of pain there and they're afraid to unleash it because they can't put it back in the bottle once they let it out so that's the fear but you know I tell professionals and I tell clients feelings just are they're not good or bad Um, you need to give yourself permission to feel bad because you have a disorder or because your, your uh, family member has a disorder there's pain and that's that grief and a lot of professionals are just fearful of unleashing it giving it permission and then what are they going to do with it the answer is you don't have to do anything but validate. And this is what they haven't quite got. I try to give them permission. You don't have to do anything. Those feelings, you know? Your job isn't to make people feel better. Your job is to listen and validate and agree. Yeah, it's hard. Stuttering is hard. And it sucks sometimes. And that's okay. Now, what are we going to do about it? And we can go on, but to, to validate the experience and not, uh, not try to wash it away and not try to uh, give permission. And people are ready to work. And we work more productively. When they've gotten that sort of out of the way. Hard for professionals to learn that. Because they've been taught. Caitlin, you're experiencing this, you know. When you got a supervisor there, you've got to be doing. Got to be solving. Got to be curing. That, that's not only from the supervisor's point of view, but you carry that into the And to sit back and listen and have client cry and agree with client that, yeah, this sucks, it's lousy. Doesn't look like you're doing a whole lot. But the, it's the greatest gift you can give your client is that permission to feel bad. Because nobody else is doing it. They're all trying to keep it in the bottle because they don't know what to do with it. And that's what's happened to the professional. So they don't. That's why it strikes fear. I mean, it's fear because they feel like their client is so vulnerable, they might make the wrong move and might hurt them and scar them for life. You know, the, the, the motive is not, is not uh, bad. It's just based on the insecurity and fear and the lack of training that the professionals have.
you know, uh, David, you know, uh, uh, knowing this, that there is, there is, you know, that there, there is, you know, there is, you know, there is a lack of clinical training for SLPs professionals in in counseling. You know, what you know, what would you suggest that that you know that we do to to actually bring it to the attention of a government for funding to get more, you know, more, you know, more training for SLPs, audiologists, just because, you know, like I'm thinking that, you know, it, it, it's, you know, it is fine and dandy to go to, you know, to go to a speech language pathologist to, you know, to work on, uh, on, on, on speech therapy for the stuttering, but, 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 you know, but I feel that if, you know, like, if, you know, like, if, if, you know, if the emotional component of stuttering is not addressed appropriately, you know, you know, like a person who, who, who stutters won't, you know, won't be able to benefit fully from the speech, you know, speech, you know, therapy aspect. You know what I mean? Sure. I'm on, I'm on your same page. And I think, uh, I think, you know, Caitlin's got the, uh, right approach is you gotta keep agitating for more. Um, at a number of different levels. One is at the national level and the organization, uh, the American Speech and Hearing Association, in your case, the Canadian Speech and Hearing Association, agitate for more workshops and, and counseling to uh, ensure that more courses are being offered and more opportunities are being offered. Um, there's material out there, and uh, you know it's it, it's fear based, um, and, uh, and uh, something we can address, but we have to agitate for it. And I hope uh, that's why I'm here today, and uh, I'm hoping you're going to carry the torch even further. Sounds like Caitlin's already aboard, and you too, Greg. Uh, David, I, 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 you know, I listen, you know, listen to your interview on the uh, uh, Stutter Talk, and uh, I, I, know, I, I, you know, I was in 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 in, in, in awe with you know with your wisdom. About the emotional component of stuttering, you know, you, you know, you, you know, you, you, you know, you talked at length about grief and you know, grief, you, you, you know, like stuttering in terms of grief, grief that stuttering is a loss. You also talked about denial, and uh, uh, you also, uh, you know, uh, you know, shared in you know, it, shared an analogy about. Denial about the car and the noise. Do you want to share that with our listeners? Because it, because it really sums yeah. it up. Well, uh, well, the role that denial plays in all of this, uh, and denial, you know, it's not a it's not a bad thing. We, we, we're going to get off judgment and being judgmental here, but denial very often gets in the way. Though professionals see it, it's getting in the way. But denial is a coping strategy with loss. And it's really the first stage in um, coping. When you are feeling overwhelmed, and we have this built into our psyche, you don't know that you're consciously doing it. When you're feeling overwhelmed um, and in totally inadequate to deal with the situation, you go into denial and it's, it's that self-protection from being emotionally um, disabled. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a positive thing, it's a coping thing for the client. And really it's for the client's parents more than, than anything. And so uh, it manifests itself in very many different ways. But the example I used for me, and the one I think you're alluding to, is I'm in my car, 
and the car makes noises and that it shouldn't be making. I have I technologically challenge. I uh, my coping strategy is to put on the radio. If I still hear the noise, to put on the radio louder. So that's that's denial. And and it, it, it looks like parents, for example, not putting their hearing aids on the kid, or not going to sign class, um, and and they look like uh, bad parents, but no, they're not. They're inadequate. They're feeling inadequate. And the way to deal with somebody in denial is not to not to tell them they shouldn't be doing that. You can, I know I shouldn't be putting on that radio. You just become my teacher and you tell me, David, don't, don't do that. You know, that's foolish. I'll agree with you. I know it's foolish. But if that's all you're going to do for me, then I will start going passive aggressive on you. And now I won't tell you that I'm putting my radio up. But that's all I have is a coping strategy. So what you need to do is you end play. Denial is something the client gives up. <clears throat> and not something you push him out of. And the reason why you give it up is because you feel like you've found some ways of coping. So you gotta increase my confidence, you gotta increase my self-esteem, you gotta help me so I I, I recognize that maybe I got some chance here to fix what, what's broken in the car and I'll pull over to the side of the road and lift the hood because I got maybe some skill set that I can deal with. Now it's a more appropriate response because I have some confidence. So you're going to build my confidence. And, that's, and then I'll give up denial. Don't try to push me out of the Remember one time we had, uh, we have this nursery, right? And we had a, a, a parent in the nursery, early stages, in September, just started. We had a parent in the nursery and she couldn't for the life of her find the hearing aids, get hearing aids on the kid. Every, every time she came in, either the hearing aids were in her purse or even she had left them home. And a teacher of the deaf comes on and is watching the program. We have professionals who come and watch. And a teacher of the deaf is seeing this kid without hearing aids. Everybody else has got hearing aids on. Why isn't that kid wearing hearing aids, says she. Old line teacher of the deaf. She said, the mother's not ready. How can you let that go? That's child abuse. And she stormed out. And, you know, she was child centered. She wasn't looking at the parents' problem. It took the parent another couple of weeks. But then she realized that, hey, she had some power because nobody was trying to push her out of there. You know, we could have said, don't come in here unless you have hearing aids on your kid. We didn't. Just let her, let her develop her own. And she announced, yeah, I finally got the hearing aids on. I used to have to fight with my kids to do this, but I don't anymore. And, and the kid was wearing hearing aids. It came from the parent. It's so much better when it comes from the parent rather than it came because we insist and the parent has not bought in. So it's being patient, it's being compassionate, it's being loving. And not, not getting um, bogged down with blaming because they're in denial. Greg, did your parents get any, any help? About your stuttering? Oh no, 
but, but you know, back then, uh, the, 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 the David, we you know, we you know, we knew you know, knew, knew nothing about stuttering, and you know, like I have uh, four, four uh, 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 other brothers that stutter as well, and uh, but you know, you know, we live you know, lived you know, lived in a small community. And you know, uh, you know, I'm, uh, you know, uh, you know, I live, you know, live in Newfoundland, so we we didn't have, have, have you know, have, have, you know, have, have, you know, have any a access to speech therapy at all. So, you know. yeah, but you know, the parents are kind of grieving, and we uh, need to work with the uh, with the parents, and then a lot of a lot of professionals either don't see it or don't feel comfortable working with the parents. And, uh, they've got a stuttering problem too. And, uh, same thing with spouses, of, uh, people with uh, communication disorders. I um, want to interject, I don't have a question, but I did one for any of our listeners that are listening right now direct them to one of our older episodes that we did with April Kennedy. I always recommend that interview to people when it comes to listening about a parent perspective because she talks about um, parenting her child and all the things that she wishes she had done differently parenting her child who stutters and then how that changed when she went to the support group, the stuttering support group, um, and how that support group uh, impacted her life in a very positive way. And I, I always recommend that episode to people for listening about the parent perspective. And so I just want to interject because it fits perfectly with everything that we're talking about. I can recommend uh, a, a video that I did. One of the best examples of my work for the Stuttering Foundation in the U.S. And it's, it's now called Conversations with Parents. Um, but it's, it's me working with a group of parents of children who stutter. And I think you can get the perspective of what it's like for the parents. And I repeat, if you take good care of the parents, the kids benefit enormously. I think it's the most efficient way of working. And we did this in the nursery. We really worked hard with the parents. We taught them, they would go into the nursery they would start doing the lessons and we would be watching them. And then when they were upstairs with me, so it was truly parent-centered. Most people say, you know, professionals say how important the parents are, but then they really are focused on the kid and then give, uh, you know, a hurried conference afterwards to the parents, have an evening meeting, and, when they bring experts in, but no, we, what, what we've done and what needs to be done, particularly in the early stages of diagnosis, is, is put the parents in the center of their your professional attention. They're the most important people. And that extends out to adults as well. Uh, I've done a lot of work now with, with spouses of chronically ill. First wife had MS and uh, lived with MS for a long time. And so I've done a lot of different support groups with the spouses who don't get much attention. But, and one mother, one mother, one wife stood up in one group during our facility. She said, You know, I have had MS for 15 years, only nobody knows it. And we all all understood that extremely. So, yeah, if I have a second message in addition to working at the, at the emotional level, it's working at the family level. And that this isn't a, a confined to the identified patient, but it's also uh, a family uh, event. So that really expands, you see, Greg, the scope of practice. And a lot of professionals beginning, but especially beginning ones, are so focused on identified patients and trying to cure him or, or 
help him or her. Um, and they uh, forget about all the other stuff. And in the early stages, I can understand this, but I think later on, and that's what I think um, happens and where I um, come in very often. These professionals have been out there for a few years. I seem to feel comfortable working at the identified patient level. I realize there's something more that they need to be doing. And what they need to be doing is working at the emotional level, allowing that to be part of it, and then working at the family level. The second piece of it. And, and did, did David during your you know your you know your you know your your interview on some sort of law, you you also t t t talked at length about fluency, like fluency drives. Uh, uh, you know, fluency expects uh, 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 clients to be normal, and uh, it, it's you know it's it, 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 it's sometimes uh, uh, the you know the you know the you know the actual session is is, is chasing fluency. So, so would you know would you know would you like to elaborate a little more on on your thoughts about fluency? Well, yeah, I mean, a parent uh, a parent wants the kid to be when he was supposed to be, or she was supposed to be, which is fluent. Um, fluency is, is um, normal. And when the kid isn't fluent, then um, the parents have a, a, a great deal of, of guilt feelings. That they may, or may have done something to cause their child to be non-fluent. Um, they also have a, a, a feeling of being overwhelmed and scared um, uh, that the, the kid is, is going to be unhappy and um, they want to make things better. Um, they also think the child is kind of fragile, so they, want to, uh, they tend to get overprotective. And they do a lot of things that are are uh, not in the kid's best interest. I, and I'm sure that it was done to you, or maybe not, since you had all this non fluency in your family. But parents trying to make you fluent and to tell you to, you know, do all kinds of things, stop and think first, and all of the the things that lay people might do, but that bring attention to the stuttering then they're forced to stutter at the, to do more stuff to um, become fluent and I think uh, you know that the more you try to become fluent very often the more you stutter so um, the, that's a lot of the lay person coming in increasing the attention that the stutterer might feel that the kid might so, you know, intervening at the parent level in the early stages is critical, absolutely essential. Best thing you can do for a client, so you, you make the kid you know, to talk about fluency and talk about what it feels like. <laughs> I'm not trying to sell something, but you may want to find that video. And, uh, Listen to the parents' perspective, the way Kathleen was talking about the parent you've had here. These are parents of stuttering kids and how perplexing stuttering is as a disorder for them, um, as it is for sometimes professionals as well. You know, uh, this m may not be be a, a you know fair question, but what do you, you know? What do you, do you think, David? Based on your you know your experience, would you know would you know would you know would you know would be the key uh, uh, the you know, the key area of studying that needs to be addressed? Well, it's a you know, we you know we you know we know there's a lot involved in stuttering, but 
is, is, is there one area that stands out with you that needs to be addressed? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, uh, uh, I got, I had my master's degree in SLP, so I, I took a, a stuttering course and actually had a couple of clients clinically who were stuttering, and then I switched over into audiology for my doctorate. I didn't touch stuttering for a long time until I came back. They asked me to do these uh, workshops, and I don't know, there's a group called the Friends in uh, the United States that um, Lee Cogniano runs, Friends Association, and I and a number of workshops there. Again, working at the at the um, at the at the parent level. Um, what needs to happen is, and what is, uh, I knew back then, and I still see today too, is how hard the stutterer is working. So his inability to relax and how much energy is put into avoiding stuttering. And I think if you can help the better of being more comfortable stuttering, emotionally and physically more comfortable with their stutter. You can get rid of a lot of the pain and anxiety that stuttering generates. And, so, and you get them going out more, involving themselves in more social activity. And uh, even though they may, the, the fluency may be more or less, it doesn't impede them. You want, I think ultimately you want from a stutterer being able to say, I stutter and so what? To get to that stage, I mean, it's gonna take a lot of work. But it's really self-acceptance the stuttering, being able to go and do whatever they want to do, not not let them, not let the stuttering limit them. I think that's going to be the ultimate goal in therapy, not not curing the stuttering. Uh, if you're working only at the speech level, that you know, I don't think you're going to be successful. I think the successful stutterer is one who doesn't let the stuttering limit them. Not in the fluency. Well, it, I mean, the, 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 you know, that's, you know, that, that's excellent wisdom, David. Thank you very much for that. You know, now, before we close, uh, Caitlin, do, do you have, have have any more questions for David or any comments? I mean, I could ask thousands of questions. <laughs> know. Um, we don't, you. yeah, we don't really have time for that. I'm just kind of trying to absorb all the information before I go into clinic this afternoon because it's it's a great perspective to take with me into my like my first ever session. Um, and so, just thank you for sharing with us all of that. You're very welcome. And if you want me to come back sometime, we can work that out. We, uh, we will have uh, have you back for sure, David. Now, just one, one, one last question. Do, 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 do you, you know, do, do, do you have any suggestions for Caitlin and I as, as we con you know, continue with this podcast. No, <laughs> I, I, other than, uh, I mean, I think keep going, but um, I, I'm, uh, I think maybe a um, interview a, a parent who has a stuttering child um, would be I think, a, a good place to go. 
as well as um, getting a group of stutterers together, talking. I can't say enough for a support group. And, uh, you know, Greg, for you to have a chance to talk with a bunch of other people. I don't know, have you ever had that where you've talked to a whole bunch of stutterers sitting around in a circle? share your experiences with one another. Well, you do, who do, you know, who do have, you know, who do have a monthly support group, David, here, you know, you know here in Newfoundland. And, uh, you know, we, we, you know, meet monthly and we also, you know, we also have, have parents involved as well. So, you know, the, 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 the support group is, is now virtual, but it's, it's, it's growing, it's growing, so. No. Really important. Yeah. Oh, def oh definitely, David, definitely. Yeah. Oh, I'm so glad. Uh, you're doing good. Keep up the good work. <laughs> Thank you. This has been an episode of Some Stutter, Luck, Newfoundland and Labrador's first podcast about communication with supporters. Some Stutter, La is hosted and produced by Greg O'Grady, Caitlin Mayo, Dr. Paul D. Decker, Lindy Crane, Emily Murphy, and Luca Dino. Some Stutter La is available on Anchor, Spotify, Breaker, Google Podcasts, Pocket Cast, and Radio Public. You can also check out the Some Stutter Blue Channel on YouTube. To ask a question, send us a comment or suggestion, or just to get in touch, find us online at Some Stutter Podcast on Instagram or at Some Stutter Lupod on Facebook. Thanks for listening.